Treasury and IRS's Priority Guidance Plan. That's the subject of today's Act Tech Trust and Estate Talk. Welcome to Act Tech Trust and Estate Talk from the American College of Trust and Estate Council, a professional society of peer elected trust and estate lawyers in the United States and around the globe. This series offers professionals best practice advice, insights, and commentary on subjects that affect our profession and clients. And now, our ActTech Fellow host with today's topic. This is Susan Snyder, ActTech Fellow from Chicago. In mid November, the Treasury Department and the IRS released their priority guidance plan for the 12 months from July 2020 through June 2021. To hear highlights of their plan of interest to estate planners, you will be hearing today from ActTech fellow Ron Opkett of Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very much, Susan. The Treasury IRS Priority Guidance Plan always is a good source for being reminded of the regulations and other administrative guidance that we might see in the near future. So we were looking for this to come out. Usually, even though, like Susan says, the plan year runs from July through June, they come out in the fall, so they're always a little late. That uh, was no exception this year. And for that reason, some of the items in what is what's called a plan have actually already been completed. And that's actually one of the first items I want to mention because it's so important to a state and trust administration. Part one of the plan is devoted to the remaining work needed to finish the guidance implementing the 2017 Tax Act, the so-called Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And item four of part one relates to the deduction of the state and trust expenses. Now, those are expenses that are described in Section 67E of the Internal Revenue Code that have been deductible above the line in calculating adjusted gross income not subject to the 2% floor on miscellaneous itemized deductions that was enacted by the Tax Reform Act of 1986. The good news is that the 2017 Act suspended the 2% floor on miscellaneous itemized deductions for eight years. But the bad news is that the deduction of miscellaneous itemized deductions themselves are suspended for eight years through 2025. And yes, that means entirely disallowed, not just subject to a 2% floor. The regulations got a late start, uh, partly because in 2018, the Treasury Department first requested comments on this subject, and they received and considered a lot of comments. Then the proposed regulations were published May 11, 2020, and the final regulations October 29, 2020. That part happened pretty quickly. As expected, the regulations clarified at Section 67E expenses may continue to be deducted by estates and trusts which was pretty clear under the 2017 Act. That's not the end of the matter. There are also excess deductions in the year that a state or trust terminates, deductions that might actually be higher in that year because of the expenses of making distributions, preparing all the necessary documentation like receipts, catching up on paying all expenses, and so forth. Those higher deductions might not be fully deductible against income for that year, which is actually being reduced because of the sale and distribution of income producing assets, and there might just not be enough income to cover the deductions. Will those excess deductions continue to be carried out to the beneficiaries who receive distributions under Section 642H? This might have been harder for the Treasury and IRS to deal with than the 67E question because the statute and the existing regulations weren't as helpful. But these new regulations provide that, yes, indeed, those excess deductions can be passed through and be deducted by beneficiaries. And the 2020 instructions for Schedule K-1 of Form 1041 that were released on October 21st confirm that and explain how those deductions should be reported. This is extremely important and helpful because otherwise fiduciaries would be under pressure to better match income and expenses by artificially timing expenses, sales, and distributions in ways that could be unfair and frustrating to both fiduciaries and beneficiaries. In this regard, 
the drafters of the regulations, I think, showed very good sensitivity to the comments they got from the public, including ACTEC's comments of February 19, 2019, and June 22, 2020. That second set of ACTEC comments were submitted after the proposed regulations had been published and specifically recommended some clarifications of the allocation of expenses among items of income, which the final regulations did make. Now let's turn to some items in the plan that are not completed, but still underway. Part three of the plan is titled burden reduction, and item 14 of part three deals with basis consistency. These are the rules in sections 1014F and 6D35 that Congress enacted in a hurry in 2015 to meet a specific revenue need by requiring that if an asset included in a decedent's gross estate increases the amount of estate tax for that estate, then the basis of that asset in the hands of an estate beneficiary cannot exceed its estate tax value. And to that end, also requiring the executor to report that basis to the beneficiaries. Anybody who has had to work with this basis reporting since 2015 knows it's a headache and that the 2015 legislation just wasn't thought through very well. And proposed regulations published in March 2016 weren't much help. In addition to capital letter number 50, by the way, there's more on this subject in capital letter number 44. In particular, get this, the proposed regulations require that within 30 days of filing the estate tax return, each beneficiary must be told on a Schedule A of Form 8971 the initial basis, that is the value reported for estate tax purposes, of each asset the beneficiary might ever receive, even though they might never receive it, thereby stirring up a lot of false expectations. You know, which, what executor who has to file a state tax return knows within 30 days who's going to get what? There's a lot of estate administration to be done before that can happen. This really could create or aggravate tension among beneficiaries and between beneficiaries and executors, even though the statute seems to require the report only be given to people acquiring the property. The proposed regulations also uh, require that property that's after discovered or otherwise omitted from the estate tax return in good faith is given an initial basis of zero. Well, that imposes in effect a penalty on the beneficiary, perhaps many years, many decades later, for a good faith omission the executor made. And even though none of the statutory triggers of the basis rule in section 1014 F1 seem to be satisfied in that scenario. And then the proposed regulations require that the recipient of that Schedule A I mentioned must in turn file a Schedule A when making any gift or other retransfer of the property that results wholly or partly in a carryover basis for the transferee. This reporting requirement apparently continues forever until there's a sale or death or something like that that steps up the basis. And this is regardless of the size of the estate of each transferor. And even though, by the way, Section 6035 imposes the reporting requirement only on an executor, not on, say, a donor. And now finalizing these terrible regulations appears under the heading of burden reduction. That makes no sense, of course, unless Treasury does plan to reduce burdens by providing relief from at least some of these tough requirements. So I predict probably in this order of likelihood, a walk back of the 30-day deadline, more robust exceptions, maybe relaxation of the retransfer rule, and possibly even relief from the zero basis rule. Next, there are five items under the heading of gifts and estates and trusts in the part of the plan titled general guidance. Number one, is guidance on basis of grantor trust assets at death under section 1014. It's hard to tell what the scope of this project is. Uh, as explained in capital letter number 50, it might indeed be limited just to trusts created by non-US persons, or the scope might be broader than that, or it might be narrow and could be expanded. In that light, we can't really tell if the news is going to be good or bad, but it is guidance will be watching for. Number two, guidance on user fee for estate tax closing letters under section 
2001. This is new. Before June 1st, 2015, the IRS routinely issued a closing letter when the determination of an estate tax return uh, was closed, the examination was closed, except returns that were not required for estate tax purposes, but were filed solely to elect portability. But in June 2015, the IRS website was updated to state that henceforth, closing letters would be issued only upon request. About a year and a half later, Notice 2017-12 confirmed that and also confirmed informal reports that we had heard that an estate tax account transcript on the IRS website that includes the transaction code 421 and the explanation closed examination of tax return can, as the notice put it, serve as the functional equivalent of an estate tax closing letter. I've heard lots of stories about how a request for a closing letter or accessing a transcript are very frustrating experiences. And besides, think about it, a transcript with a code 421 just doesn't have the same dignity as a closing letter. And it's just not as easy to use to obtain releases of leads, closing of accounts, approval of distributions, and other objectives closing letters have routinely and easily been used for in the past. Now, I've also heard that the IRS abandoned automatic closing letters for budgetary reasons. The Congress just wasn't giving it enough money. That explanation never made sense. Presumably, a closing letter is, or at least it could be, computer generated from the same computer records that support transcripts. And doesn't it require the same diligence and the same involvement of personnel, in other words, the same expense, to generate the transaction code 421 anyway? And the IRS doesn't even pay postage on the letter. So when this user fee project comes to fruition, my expectation is that we will be back to business as usual the user fees will be modest, and the issue of whether the budgetary concerns are really justified will just go away. Number three is regulations under Section 2032A regarding impositions of restrictions on estate assets during the six-month alternate valuation period. There's a lot of history to this, including another example of the Treasury and IRS listening to public comments, which prompted the reproposal of earlier regulations. Basically, it's pretty clear the biggest target here is probably techniques like creating a limited partnership within the first six months after death or making a series of distributions of fractional interests and assets during the first six months after death and claiming additional valuation discounts. Don't count on that continuing. Number four, regulations under Section 2053 regarding personal guarantees and the application of present value concepts in determining the deductible amount of expenses and claims against the estate. This is an outgrowth of amendments of the Section 2053 regulations in 2009. And again, as capital letter number 50 describes, it reflects sensitivity to public comments that were submitted about the original proposed regulations before 2008. Number five is <clears throat> regulations under section 7520 regarding the use of actuarial tables in valuing annuities, interest for life or terms of years, and remainder or reversionary interests. The current mortality tables are based on 2000 census data. They became effective May 1st, 2009. And under Section 7520C2, they should have been revised to reflect 2010 census data and to be effective as of May 1st, 2019. Well, they weren't. Apparently, in the last couple of months, the IRS has received the data needs from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and these revised tables should be near completion now. As capital letter number 50 notes, it is reasonable to assume that there will be transitional relief for taxpayers who, since May 1st, 2019, have relied on the mortality tables that took effect in May of 2009. But remember, we're only looking at calculations since May 1st, 2019, that involve mortality or actuarial data. The values of an interest for life, an interest for joint lives, an interest for term, uh, life, whichever shorter or longer, remainder following interest, and so forth. We will not need any transitional relief for calculations based just on interest rates 
that have been published every month on time, for example, for promissory notes or grants that involve only fixed terms. Well, as usual, Susan, the introduction to the Priority Guidance Plan states, the 2020-2021 Priority Guidance Plan contains guidance projects that will be the focus of efforts during the 12-month period from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. But focus does not necessarily mean finish. Except for the Section 7520 actuarial tables, we might not see an end result of any of these projects before July but we will be watching for them. Thank you, Ron, for your roundup of the Priority Guidance Plan and your predictions. We look forward with hope to what the next months will bring from Treasury and the IRS. Thank you for listening to this episode of AgTech Trust and Estate Talk, the podcast series about wealth planning matters from the American College of Trust and Estate Council. To find an AgTech lawyer near you, visit ACTEC.org. Please subscribe to this series and leave us a rating or a review. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at AgTech Talk.